I just got out of seeing Hellboy, the reboot, directed by Neil Marshall, and starring, I believe his name is David Mitchell, as the new actor playing Hellboy. Uh, David Harbour, sorry, as Hellboy. So, Neil Marshall is, in a lot of ways, a very different director from Guillermo del Toro. Um, if you've seen some of his other movies, like Dog Soldiers and that sort of thing, it's pretty cl- it is a pr- it's a pretty straightforward thing. Um, Marshall is has a very different directorial style. He's very he's more upfront with the blood and gore. It's not that Del Toro doesn't do blood, doesn't do gore, doesn't do R-rated horror films. He uses violence in his movies very differently than Marshall does. And so when it came into this one, like, okay, this is a hard R-rated Hellboy movie, I was expect I and I saw the Red Band trail, like, okay, this is a very different tonally from what I'd seen before. And I admit, I it's been a while since I read a the last time I read a Hellboy comic, and I hadn't read we really reread anything going into the movie, so I wasn't sure. So I, I'm gonna have to go back and reread some Hellboy stuff, but it definitely only when it comes to violence felt very different from the comics in that regard. That said, um, I'm getting a little bit into spoilers here. First off, this is clearly a straight-up reboot of Hellboy. Um, this is, and it's interesting looking at this, not just in the sense of, oh, it's it kind of has to be a straight-up reboot because it's we don't have Del Toro back, and the original two Hellboy movies definitely had Del Toro's touch um, on the film. Um, tonally, they fit in with a lot of Del Toro's oeuvre. Also, recasting Hellboy himself, Ron Perlman brought a very particular cadence to the role, and so it's a question of do you try to match, or do you just do your own thing? And the answer in the case of this film is they do their own thing. And it partially works and it partially doesn't in a couple different respects. The way it works is in the sense that the bits I remember of Hellboy comics, now they're not bloody violent, but they're also paint the Fey world having element having very pronounced elements, and the, the Fey world is very much in the forefront of this in a way that it was in the uh, Hellboy Two: The Golden Army, but also in ways that it very much isn't, and. The Fae in Hellboy are at odds not just based on confrontations between the human world and the fairy world in terms of the encroachment of human society on the forests and the wilds and that sort of thing, but also kind of the sense that while there are Fae who can totally get along fine with people, there are also Fae... The Fae aren't human. They're not. And so... They... Like... Well, long st- to, to, to put it in short, Baba Yaga is a character in this film. And Baba Yaga eats babies. Like Baba Yaga does in the Legends. But Baba Yaga is... A lot of things, if you read the story, if, if you're familiar with legends and stories and folklore about the character of Baba Yaga, she can be benef- she can she can be helpful. She can help you can help people, but you have to be very very careful in dealing with Baba Yaga because if you do, if you're not careful, she will cross you. And in fact, she's always looking for an opportunity to cross you. And I mean, then, like, also eating babies has kind of always been part of the Baba Yaga legend um, and folklore. So, 
that there was the whole there's that whole aspect of the fey folk as boogeymen as the things who will take children out of their um bedrooms not in the sense of oh we're playing replace them with the changeling but in the sense of just take them and eat them um giants in the sense of fee fi fo fum i smell the blood of an englishman not in the cartoonish sense but in the they eat people sense and they're not something where they can get along with humanity whereas opposed to hellboy 2 the golden army del toro was kind of pushing towards an idea of that maybe the fey folk aren't the bad guys that human encroachment in the fey realm is make is putting the fey on the defensive and their actions are just are or justified when that's kind of applying a human morality to them whereas again giants eat people they like to eat people they particularly like sucking bone marrow and human bone marrow and so if they're gonna drink the blood of and eat the flesh and suck the bone marrow of englishmen if they if they want to do that, they'll do that, and this isn't a case of oh, maybe try the cattle bone marrow instead. It's no, no, there's nothing you necessarily negotiate with. It's they, it you you put them down, and that's kind of the the circumstance there. Um, it's the interpretation of the BPRD kind of as the supernatural worlds game wardens to a certain extent that if the demon that the demons stay out if the fey folk don't murder people then the bprd isn't going to come around it's when they it, it's when you steal it it's when you it, the, not just, oh, a changeling can replace a, a child with a fae, but a changeling replaces a child with a fae, and that child is likely going to go end up in Baba Yaga's larder, that's when the BPRD swoops in, and definitely in circumstances where you have various varieties of cultists cutting deals with the supernatural for material power and gain in our world at the detriment of humanity as a whole. Like, for example, the circumstances behind which Hellboy coming about. Speaking of which, we do get another flashback in this movie of the circumstances leading to Hellboy entering our world. Um, and the movie includes has the inclusion of Lobster Johnson, which I thought was a nice, interesting touch. He doesn't do as much as I'd like, but Lobster Johnson is one of the characters who pops up every now and then in the background of Hellboy stories and sometimes serves a very instrumental role, sometimes less so, until he comes very much to the fore. So I'm impressed to see him here. This kind of gets into David Harbour as Hellboy himself. Ron Perlman's performance as Hellboy was very understated. Hellboy in Perlman's performance was... It's not that Hellboy wasn't emotional. I mean... Ron Perlman is never really does a flat performance. Even when he's understated, he's not flat. It's Hellboy has the personality of if he uh, the, the Hellboy persona that Ron Perlman put forward is one where if Hellboy is about to get hit by a club and he sees it coming, it's going to be a very understated oh crap. Not because it's going to really hurt him for this to happen. Not because he's going to be upset really because he's hit by a club. It is going to be something of an inconvenience. He can be knocked for about a half a mile. He's going to have to hike a bunch. He's going to get knocked through a tree, and that's going to hurt. But it's not going to cause the meaningful damage that would cause that a human would have if they were struck in the same way. Um, similar sort of thing with fighting other large monsters or going up against human opponents or that sort of thing various Nazi cultists, that sort of thing. David Harbour's Hellboy 
is a little more brash and impulsive. He wears his emotions on his sleeve to an extent that Perlman's character doesn't. And but the Perlman's version of Hellboy isn't emotional, or doesn't have emotions, but he's not emotional. He is reserved, um, kind of deadpan. Um, Ron Perlman's Hellboy signature line was an oh crap, much as it was in the comics. Um, that's in Hellboy reacts in Ron Perlman's interpretation and also kind of in the comics the same way with about to be hit the Giants Club as they would being dropped into a um, two mile cavern or be about to be attacked by a 60 foot tall eldritch abomination it's the I, it's I'm not going to say it's the many reactions of Hellboy of the oh crap, but it's it's like with One Punch Man where you have that, that, that reaction image of One Punch Man with the oh kind of thing. It, it's not an oh crap, it's not a oh we're in deep doo-doo, it's not like the oh of John Wick. Because Saitama knows he can handle the situation, and it's just, it's it's a problem, and it's a mess, and he doesn't want to deal with this right now or it's going to be a ha pain for him to handle this, or it's going to be tricky, or that sort of thing. It's He's never really feels it's, it's not necessarily a challenge. And that's kind of the tack here with, with, with Perlman's Hellboys. It's not that Hellboy is inflappable and doesn't find anything a challenge. It's that he's not, it's, he hasn't found the thing that could really kill him, that could potentially kill him yet. So he's not too worried about act so he doesn't approach this as oh this might actually kill me it's like oh i'm gonna be really sore tomorrow um and this is gonna really hurt while i take this thing down and i'm gonna hate myself in the morning not because i'm feel guilty about it but because i will be beat to hell but i will survive i will overcome this it's just going to be a pain in the ass. David Harbour's Hellboy, he's... He... Still kind of has that tack of, he hasn't found the thing that's going to kill him yet, but he's not as blasé about it. He... If you're going to... If he gets stabbed with a whole bunch of stuff, he's going to react like, ow, that really, really hurts! And he's going to cuss up a storm... And that sort of thing. And he's less inflappable. And that's the general difference of tack. He's more shouty. He's can be a little more uptight. He'll slam a door. He will do that sort of thing. And that's a very dramatic shift. And in some scenes it works, in other scenes it doesn't. It's like this version of Hellboy is more of an angry, uptight teenager. Older, like, like, 14, 15, but still a teenager. He's a teenager who's old enough to drink, teenager who's old, it's, he's old enough to drink, he's old enough to smoke, but he has the attitude and mindset of a teen. And that's kind of the thing here. Um, Ian McShane is fantastic as Trevor Butterholm. Um, it does kind of have the... It's got a bit of baggage of, if you're familiar with the comics, if you're familiar with the character, you know Trevor Butterholm is always on a ticking clock. And that definitely comes into effect here. But, for what time we have in the film with Butterholm, and we get a lot of it, the film, most of the film with Butterholm, uh, when Hellboy's not out in the field, um, it works, and I'm glad it plays off as well as it, it plays out as well as it does. Um, Supporting cast characters, they do a good job of setting up that the supporting cast are characters who have a thing that will help them keep up with Hellboy in some matter or you don't have um, the array of BPRD no-name red shirts following Hellboy around, maybe who have something of a name and who are also about to get murked by whatever the antagonist is going to throw at them either directly or in or by proxy. Uh, 
probably the biggest surprise of the movie for me, uh, performance wise, was Mia jo Mia Jovovich. Um, I will admit I have not been keeping up with you know her work in the Resident Evil movies, but like this is the first time I think she's played a villain in quite some time, if at all, and she does an impressive job here. I think it's I don't know if this is um the direction by Neil Marshall, or if this is just her like going, oh, I haven't gotten a chance to play a villain. I'm going to, I'm going to bust my ass on this one because I, I, I want to appreciate this. I want to enjoy this. This isn't just like a, a fun action movie, fairly light and fluffy role, like playing Alice throughout the Resident Evil movies with her um, being directed by her husband, that sort of thing. So it's, I feel like, Jovovich brought her A game here um, in a way that you don't hear about her doing very much. That said, the movie is not without its problems. Um, I'm not, the, like, again, the performance of Hell behind the character of Hellboy is its own thing. It's different from Ron Perlman. Different actors should be able to bring their own different interpretations to the character. <laughs> But, but, David Harbour's interpretation of Hellboy in this movie doesn't quite work for me. Um, I like the more, the closer to the comic, oh crap Hellboy, than the oh long string of profanities Hellboy in this movie. Um, with the blood and violence in the comics... It's not that they weren't bloody. It's not that there wasn't violence. It wasn't that they weren't macabre. You Again, Baba Yaga eating babies shows up in the comics too. But it... Neil Marshall... I mean, he's the director of Dog Soldiers, and you can tell that here. He is The, the shock horror sensibility comes through here. Um, people get torn in half. Bodies are splattered. Um, we've come across the aftermath of a giant attack, and people have gotten like split in half with clubs. There are half-eaten carcasses. There's blood, and not just there's blood, but there's entrails and brains and eyeballs and other viscera all over the place. Um, the film's climax when we have demons attacking London, like people are getting torn in half and impaled and split, and all this, that, and the other thing. It is a very hard R movie, and while there are bits about this that work, some of the monster designs and demon designs for the attack on London are very well done. The um, couple of the demons in particular are evocative in their designs to like angels from Neon Genesis Evangelion. Um, other bits don't work quite as well, and again, like, the level of blood, it's not... I'm not squeamish. But it didn't quite fit with me. For what I'm anticipating and expecting with a Hellboy movie. It doesn't fit with kind of like feel for the, the look and feel of the comics. In terms of the sense of... When I think of Mike Mignola's art. That level of, again, a person getting torn in half and blood and guts splattering all over the place is not what I think when I... Um, I could see with Mignola, a person... A, the way I describe it is... When I think violence, like graphic violence with Mignola, I think blood, I would think impalement, I would think skeletons, maybe eyeballs. But I wouldn't necessarily think viscera, other internal organs, brain matter splattering, blown open skulls, that sort of thing. I don't necessarily think... like that. It's like a little bit of some of the like um, shock horror you get with attempts to adapt. Uh, um, I, Uzumaki and Gyo and other works by that director, the director that that mangaka. Um, the name just fell Junji Ito, but not necessarily Mignola and. So again, it doesn't totally mesh here, but it what we get is okay. Um, 
I've seen a little bit of criticism. I tried not to read too many reviews going into the movie, but there's bits and pieces I saw and I couldn't avoid. Um, I saw a little bit of complaints about the needle drops in the soundtrack in terms of music notes, um, music being brought in, catalog songs, that sort of thing. And I get the complaints. They definitely fit. Uh, it didn't bug me, but it also gives the movie that that vibe of like your 90s action film where if you watch the trailer, like the last bit of the trailer isn't the cast listing and cast, list of cast and credits. It's fe soundtrack featuring songs by long list of artists and that sort of thing, which that's more iffy. So. Oh, another thing is some of the effects don't hold up very well. I did not watch this movie in IMAX, and some of the and there are a couple effects which are just which were just really jarring and like popped me out of the movie a bit. Um, one in particular is like a big, long, sh like steady on, brightly lit shot in this one effect at the very end of the movie. It doesn't work, and they just spend a lot of time on it. And the more I think about it, the more I go. If this was an IMAX, it would look worse. So there's that to keep in mind. Did I enjoy the movie? Yes. Is it a great movie? No, it's like a solid three stars. It's a good afternoon viewing. Um, but like... This, movie's, this review is coming out on the 17th. Um, as of this recording, from watching this opening weekend, Shazam is out in theaters right now, and it's getting great reviews. I have not seen it yet. It is on my to-watch list. And I picked this one over Shazam because, hey, I'm a big fan of Hellboy. I like the first two movies, and I love the comics. As a fan of Hellboy, I enjoyed this. If I didn't have my attachment to Hellboy, I might have gone with Shazam instead. And, like, this is, it's a solid rental movie. It's a solid wait for the Blu-ray, wait for Netflix, wait for Hulu, Amazon Prime, whatever streaming platform it goes on movie. It, and it's going to end up there. Or wait for Redbox. It's all right. I don't feel, like, also, I saw this movie with, like, a gift coupon I got with, because I'm a T-Mobile cell phone customer, so I got a ticket for four bucks. So, it was absolutely worth the four bucks I spent on it. If this was, um, if I'd spent 16 or 20 bucks or 18 bucks or whatever, um, to see this in IMAX or 3D or that sort of thing, I might have a lower view of the movie. I'd be a little more annoyed. It's okay. It's all right. I can't. It is. I have seen absolutely seen worse movies. It is not a bad film. It is not a fail. It it does not fail at doing what it attempts to do. But it doesn't. It it has a bar to clear that it can't get over. And I'm not even just talking about um, meeting the standards of Guillermo del Toro's adaptation. It is, in some respects, a little better or equal to uh, Hellboy 2, but it is not quite as good as the first Hellboy. Not, not as good as the first Hellboy. So, it sets up a possible sequel. Uh, I don't know if we'll get it. If we do, maybe. Um, I would like to think that for the next movie, maybe we David Harbour will have more found his footing with the character It'll have a bit more restrained performance. Um, maybe it'll be a different director. Maybe um, Neil Marshall will tone out. Will will tone the flashier elements down. I don't know. We'll see. But it was okay. Again, it is a solid three star film. It's not great. It's not bad. It's all right.
thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.